Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi, a freshman at UCLA and the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl and an MSNBC contributor, uh, as well as former General Counsel of the Army and mm-hmm. former Watergate prosecutor. With us today is Mehdi Hassan, who is currently the host of the Mehdi Hassan Show on Peacock from Monday to Thursday and on on MSNBC on Sunday. Mehdi previously served as a presenter on Al Jazeera English's Upfront and on Head to Head at the Oxford Union, as well as hosting the Intercept's Deconstructed podcast. Having had the honor of being on your show, Mehdi, I'm looking forward to our discussion today about your time in journalism, being an anchor on Peacock and MSNBC, and what you see as the future of television news and how to cover politics. Victor is going to start our questioning. Yeah, so thank you so much for being here, Maddie. We are really looking forward to this. Um, and, you know, so I just want to start by, you know, by saying, you know, a little bit about your background. You were born in London, you attended college in England, and uh, you started your career as a researcher for London Week in Television and then being an um, executive producer of um, Sky's breakfast show, Sunrise. So I'm just curious, what made journalism appealing for you um, coming out of college? That's a great question. I mean, the, the, the sad answer is I wish I had this kind of inspiring, noble vision. Uh, to offer you, I wish I had a story about watching all the president's men or something like that. But no, uh, basically, I didn't know how to do anything else, really. I have no other skills in life. Um, I went to Oxford and I did a degree in PPE. And people who do PPE either go into politics, like David Cameron, uh, or they go into you know, management, consultancy, banking, investment banking. Most of my peers were heading in the financial direction. I knew I didn't want to do that. And I knew I wouldn't be good at that. So I was left with very few options. Like, what do I do when I graduate? I don't want to go down the corporate path. Um, and therefore the media really, and my sister was already a journalist and I thought, maybe the media is a place for me. I've got a big mouth and strong views. Uh, maybe that's somewhere I can actually do something. Uh, you know, I always say God gave me a big mouth and I monetized it. I did something with it. I put it to good use. And bad use, many would say. But um, so really I had no other skills or interests. And I thought journalism, and, you know, this is this is the uh, summer of 2000. And thank God, in those days, you didn't need to have the kind of skill set you need today to become a journalist. Right now, mm-hmm. you, need to do, you need to have all sorts of editing skills, computer skills, etc. I didn't have any of that stuff. And I started as an entry level, uh, what was called a news desk assistant at ITV News. And ITV News is kind of the equivalent of NBC News uh, in the UK, uh, the main commercial rival to the BBC. And it was an entry level position. And I was basically the guy who helped book camera crews and made sure satellite trucks were in the right place, assisted the news editor on the breaking news desk. It was a very aggressive environment. Um, that was a kind of, you know, very, very macho, aggressive, uh, not very HR friendly environment. I always say in my, I think it was my second or third day on the job, I got kicked. Uh, no, no, the chair I was sitting in got kicked across the room, but I was in the chair at the time by a very angry news editor who decided just to lash out. Not at me, he was just angry and kicked the chair and ignored the 21-year-old new guy sitting in the chair. So it was a bizarre world, but it was a it was an interesting baptism for me. For sure. But it seems like you've you've been thriving in that industry. And I, I'm curious just for my generation listening to your background, it seems like you started off in the TV industry. Um, based on your experience in the industry, can you kind of distinguish um, what the difference is between like print and TV and kind of how your experience has been in the TV industry? I mean, all those differences are kind of dissolving, as you understand right now in the current era. But yes, it, it was it, it's less formal than it was, but it's still barriers. I was lucky. I started in TV production as a producer, uh, as a deputy executive producer on the Sunrise Show, as you mentioned. So I got to understand how TV news is made. I was there kind of, you know, it's actually a very useful skill now when I'm in front of the camera, that when I'm talking to my team, I know what they're doing because I've d- been there and done that. I've, I've, I've done the jobs that a lot of my colleagues are now doing to help me do what I do. Um, so it's always useful to have those experience and skills. Sometimes I think, you know, maybe I should have got this kind of public profile earlier in life, especially when I see some of the younger talent doing so well now. And, actually, and then I think, no, actually kind of 10 years behind the scenes as a nobody uh, in TV production was actually kind of useful. Um, I didn't become a public figure in the UK till the age of, what was it, 29? Um, I, I'd already spent nine years in TV. And then what I did was I quit TV. I was doing, I was at Channel 4, which is a big broadcaster in the UK, commissioning documentaries. 
And uh, the editor of the New Statesman, Jason Cowley, took a risk. New Statesman is like the British equivalent of the New Republic, center-left prominent magazine. He hired me to be effectively the political editor, and I'd never written anything in my life apart from a TV script of 20 seconds. And suddenly I was writing 1,100 word columns every week, you know, writing news stories. Um, so it was a big change for me, but I took the risk, took a pay cut and went to work for a small magazine because in those days, print was the way to kind of get your head above the parapet. And again, learned a bunch of skills there that I never had before. Editing copy, just understanding the production cycle of a magazine, all useful skills and experiences and really useful because of the pressure that you're put under and because you deal with things like the law. You deal with things like, you know, politicians putting pressure on you as a political magazine. And those are the kind of skills, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can be as famous as you want. You can have as public a profile as you want. But those are kind of life skills you really need to learn and can't get anywhere else. So I valued that huge experience. What I would say is to people now getting into the business, unfortunately, unlike me, where I was a kind of jack of all trades, master of none, I could do multiple things. Right now, my understanding, and I'm no expert on this, is you really need to kind of have a specialized knowledge. You really need to know what you want to do. Uh, and you really need to acquire the skill set that goes with that. And I think that's kind of really important. It's not enough just to say, ah, I'm interested in politics. I'll be a writer. I don't think that works anymore. I think you really need to know, well, what kind of writer? What kind of politics? What kind of skill set are you going to have? If you're going to write, are you going to be able to, you know, uh, you're going to write on your own platform. If you're going to work in TV, do you already bring a set of editing skills or are you, can you use a camera at the same time as reporting, which will endear you to news organizations with limited budgets if you can do multiple things in one go. So those are the kind of things you sadly have to factor in now in an age of kind of smaller newsrooms, uh, declining options in terms, look at, look at what's happened to the Huff Post where I used to work in recent days. Absolutely tragic, laid off dozens of people in the US, shut down the UK operation where I worked as a political director for three years. Um, yeah, the opportunities are fewer and fewer, sadly. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to move ahead in your life. So so in 2012, you, you began working at um, Al Jazeera as a presenter. And when we mean presenter, is that the equivalent of like the US's anchor for like MSNBC or, or for news channels? It is in general. My role at Al Jazeera wasn't as a news anchor. It was specifically as an interviewer. It was a kind of hmm. what is the equivalent meet the press role. They had a they invented a show called Head to Head. We invented it. I came up with the idea of doing these kind of one on one kind of gladiatorial combat interviews in front of a live audience at the Oxford Union, which we thought would be a fun place to do it because I went to Oxford. I used to debate at the Oxford Union. Everyone around the world knows the Oxford Union. It immediately implies debate conflict, um, discussion, argument. So that was the show was very deliberately framed in that way. And luckily we had great guests, big global names who agreed to come on partly because of the Oxford Union appeal, I'm guessing, to come on and basically joust with me. And our very first show with Richard Dawkins. Uh, he wasn't happy after the show. Most guests actually leave quite happy in the experience. Uh, but, you know, it was a big budget production. I'll always thank Al Jazeera for investing in that journalism and in that show because as you know from American TV, there's no there's no shows done in front of audiences anymore because they cost too much, not in the news area. Anyways, you know, you can have The View and other kind of entertainment type shows, but news tends not to do audience shows anymore. And audience shows are massive because getting live audience, uh, both reaction to what's happening and in terms of input and questions. So yeah, it was a great role. It wasn't as a news anchor. I wasn't reading the news, but I was getting this amazing opportunity to interview some of the biggest names in the world, some of the most famous thinkers, politicians, uh, and, and I became known to an American audience through head to head through one specific interview, which was with Eric Prince, uh, the founder of Blackwater, which went massively viral and even uh, helped get him referred to the DOJ by Adam Schiff at the time for investigation into whether he had lied to Congress, something we still haven't got to the bottom of, strangely. <laughs> well, so a few years later, you actually did move to the United States in 2015. And was that um, a, a job related decision or was there some other reason for moving? It was, it was 50, 50, it was half job related. It was, uh, I got offered a job by Al Jazeera to come uh, 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 do a, a weekly news and current affairs magazine show, um, which was something I couldn't turn down. It was like a dream for me. It was something I never thought I would do. I, the opportunity to do, have my own weekly show in a studio covering the news from Washington, DC. This was 2015. Here I'm thinking, well, it's going to be a Hillary Clinton presidency. It'd be an interesting time to move to the US and cover politics as Obama leaves office. Um, and also my wife is American. So that was the other part of it. It was uh, as Ariana Huffington, uh, at the time I was working at the Huffington Post, 
I remember telling her, I said, can I go work for Half Post in America? I'll make my wife happy. And she's like, yes, happy wife, happy life. We had that discussion. And um, uh, so at the time it was driven partly by an American wife and partly by um, the opportunities. You know, you know that Brits and, I, and I, you know, Brits have always thought about whether in the media, arts, entertainment, well, you know, I've done it in the UK. Can you do it in America? There's always been that kind of going back to the Beatles, uh, more recently Piers <laughs> Morgan. Um, and actually, <laughs> Uh, people talk about Piers Morgan, which kind of annoys me. I don't like to be associated with Piers Morgan for multiple reasons. But I would point more to a John Oliver or a, uh, 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 or a James Corden or a Paul Bettany uh, in one division right now. So um, I look at those, some of those Brits who have moved here, become Americans, as I did uh, last year, and uh, tried to turn their hand at doing the same thing in the U.S. And I'm enjoying yeah. it. Obviously, it was a good move for you because your career here has been terrific. Um, Thank you so much. You may know that I, I'm known for my hashtag Jill's pins. And today I'm wearing a special pin. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's a peacock because you're on peacock. Lovely. And so I thought that was an appropriate pin to wear for you today. So how did you then transition to NBC Family um, after you got here? So uh, I joined NBC last summer um, after long conversations back and forth with Phil Griffin, who used to run MSNBC, and Phil had enjoyed the Eric Prince interview and was, uh, I think it's fair to say, was kind of working out how he could incorporate me into uh, what MSNBC and its offshoots do. And there was a kind of, you know, my style is very different to the average American news anchor or the average American interviewers. And there was uh, multiple discussions back and forth. But, you know, to be fair to Phil, who's now retired and left uh, MSNBC in January, you know, he, he, he had confidence that I could pull it off. And when Peacock was being launched last year, he thought about me as someone who could do Victor, to go back to Victor's question, do a news anchor role, which was something interesting for me because I've never done that before. And my show isn't a straight news show. My nightly show, The Mandy Hassan Show, uh, is a news and opinion show. It's like a primetime MSNBC show. It's like a Chris Hayes show, maybe a little bit even more opinionated than Chris's show. Um, but it is doing the nightly news right now. We're, you know, on today's news, the horrific uh, the horrific uh, shootings in Atlanta we're talking about with my team. I just came out of an editorial meeting, how we cover that, what are the angles, who are the guests? So for me, it was like going back to my old days as a producer at Sky News uh, on a 24 hour news channel, but in a different role, being in front of the camera, but the same idea. How do you produce the best news content? How do you tell these stories? How do you break news? But also giving my own perspective on it. So it was again, another huge opportunity. I couldn't turn down. I was sad to leave The Intercept where I was working full time until last summer. An amazing organization, uh, groundbreaking investigative journalistic operation where I was able to basically do whatever I wanted. The freedom I had at The Intercept, you know, media organizations tend not to offer that kind of freedom and The Intercept did. I was able to do a podcast on anything I liked, a column on anything I liked. But so with a heavy heart, I left The Intercept only because I couldn't turn down uh, this nightly news show. And I left Al Jazeera, which was also very sad doing head to head and up front. But this Peacock show has been great. You know, again, it was a risk. Victor, to go back to an earlier question, like, you know, in terms of like career decisions, life is about taking risks. I've taken a lot of career risks mm -hmm. in my life, uh, quitting uh, a highly paid uh, uh, job at Channel 4. I was on a kind of upward management career path to go be a journalist at the New Statesman with much, you know, with a lower salary, no benefits taking a big risk there, moving to America to do a show for Al Jazeera in 2015, not knowing whether Al Jazeera would work out in the US moving countries. And now basically coming to work for Peacock, which, okay, it's NBC, but no one had ever heard of, I'd never heard of Peacock uh, when they came and offered me the job. So, but it's been amazing. And I, and I, I have no regrets whatsoever. Peacock is doing great. Uh, the number of subscribers is up. Uh, the number of people who watch the show. Uh, we've done interesting, unique things in that space. We've had some great guests on from, you know, big name politicians like the Elizabeth Warrens of this world to kind of, you know, celebrities like Mark Ruffalo coming on and talking about, you know, Native Americans and Palestinians. So uh, the Peacock thing has been a, an amazing move. And then the MSNBC gig, uh, which uh, I started February now. Yeah, last month, time flies. Uh, we're on week four. Uh, has also been something I, you know, I never thought would happen because I just thought my style and my um, background won't gel, but clearly it has or is. Fingers crossed it stays that way. I, I want to go back to something you said, uh, which was your mention of the Eric Prince interview, which was an astounding thing and something you've said before, which is that in the UK, there is a much less respectful approach to interviewing <laughs> big names. And... Um, I'm, I, I'd like you to talk more about that and whether you think that that style, yeah. you can use it now 
in your shows here, whether that's going to work, how, how you feel about that approach? It's a great question. And uh, I have talked about it before. And I think the British, uh, the British media has a lot of problems. The British press has a lot of problems. You don't need me to tell you that. You heard Meghan Markle uh, make that argument just recently. There's problems of racism, of sensationalism, especially in the tabloid press. But I think when it comes to TV journalism and TV interviews, I would argue uh, uh, the Brits do it better than most. And, you know, I grew up in a time and, and people, listeners, viewers can Google him, Jeremy Paxman, very famous BBC uh, news host, uh, who's famous for asking the British Home Secretary in the 1990s the same question 14 times. It became an iconic interview where he just repeated the question 14 times because the interviewee wasn't answering it. Uh, I grew up in an era of John Humphreys, who was a radio presenter, who politicians literally feared going on his show in the morning. It was the most prominent breakfast show, but still went because it was so prestigious. Um, and he would just grill them and perhaps over interrupt them. Some would argue he went too far, but it was a tack dog, bulldog form of journalism. So that's where I come out of. Those are the people I grew up watching and listening to. And when I got my own show, I thought that is what I want to do. I do want to hold people to count. Head to head was consciously styled. You know, it was called cool, head to head. It was this idea of a combat. And for Americans, it is a very different world. I remember interviewing Otto Reich, the former Bush administration official on Head to Head. And I said, just want to be clear, when we were speaking in the green room beforehand, it's a very tough combat of interviews, nothing personal. I do it with everyone, regardless of the views. And he said, oh, I've done many American interviews. I've done the toughest interviews, don't worry about it. And afterwards he was kind of shell-shocked and he wasn't happy. And I was like, because of the toughest American interview doesn't really compare. And I look at people like Jake Tapper, and Chris Wallace and Jake's a friend of mine. Uh, they're great interviewers and they are the, probably the toughest interviewers on cable right now, but they're still not as tough as the, uh, you know, an, an Andrew Neil in the UK, who was the most recent kind of BBC interrogator in chief. And I think, um, you know, I, and to be fair to uh, cable anchors and news hosts, it's also a cultural thing. You know, American viewers are not that comfortable with it. I get people telling me off on Twitter that I was too tough. And American politicians themselves are pretty thin skinned. You know, we talk about snowflakes that apply to Republicans <laughs> as well as Democrats. I've interviewed politicians who get very upset. They're not used to it. And so I've had colleagues. Your intention, like, though, to keep up with, a, a, to try to use the British harder style? I think the issue is that, and this is a, this is a reality that I have to deal with and navigate, and I don't know if there's a right answer to this, which is if you are so tough, the problem is, so John Humphreys, I mentioned him, he was the iconic BBC Radio 4 Today program host. That was the show that set the political agenda. If you went on that show, it was a big deal. The problem now we have is, so he was able to be tough and still get great guests. The problem you have now is if you're very tough and I'm a politician, I can just avoid your show. There's 17,000 outlets, especially if you're a Republican. You know, people say, why don't you have more Republicans on the show? They won't come on. You know, they, they talk about safe spaces on college, college campuses. The Republican party has an entire media safe space. You know, Fox News, OAN and Newsmax that provides them with softball interviews and, you know, friendly chats. There's a reason why Donald Trump went to talk to Bartiromo on the phone on Fox last night, because he can. And because he knows if he goes anywhere else, he'll be challenged on his election lies and his racism and the rest. So I think this is the problem we now have. People like me have to navigate as well, although it's still possible. In my second month on air at Peacock, we had John Bolton on the show. And I did grill him. And I think he was a bit surprised. If you watch that interview, he keeps telling me the time's up, wrap it up, because he's not comfortable with the questions I was asking him about the Iraq war and his responsibility for all those deaths. And I think a few people pointed out that it's sad it took, you know, 17 odd years for someone to actually ask John Bolton on TV whether he has trouble sleeping at night, whether he has blood on his hands, which is what I asked. I just want to ask you about the, the current backdrop of increasing polarization and politicization of the facts and uh, the media. And you've been in the media industry for a long time. Have you seen... Thanks for making me feel old, Victor. <laughs> um, with a long time does come a lot of experience as well. But um, have you seen a change in the amount of misinformation, disinformation that is now being spewed? Oh, I mean, it's on a different level. We can't keep up with it. Neither you nor I... Uh, in this conversation could even do justice to the levels of misinformation out there. Right now, as we're speaking, imagine how many posts are being put on Facebook, how many WhatsApps are being shared um, that are completely false, uh, just made up. And the problem we have is, it's, it's, it's a dub, it's, the problem we have is, if it was just randos in Macedonia uh, posting you know, fake stories about the Pope endorsing Trump and them going viral on Facebook, that would be one particular challenge, which we could find a way to deal with. The problem we have right now is that the attack on journalism, on the media, on facts 
is not just a rando in Macedonia trying to make money or kind of, you know, some crazy InfoWars guy uh, or kind of mad Nazis on some far right forum. It is one of our two major political parties which are complicit in this assault on truth, on facts, on reality, on democracy. So, you know, just take the recent cancel culture nonsense that Republicans have been obsessed with. It's not just that they ignored the fact we're in a pandemic killing thousands of people a day. It's not just the fact that they ignored a debate in Congress over the American Rescue Plan and didn't even focus on the contents of it. Put that to one side, that's bad enough. It's that when they pushed this cancel culture nonsense about Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head, it wasn't even accurate. I mean, if we were banning Dr. Seuss and if we were changing the name of Mr. Potato Head, at least, you know, I'd still be annoyed that you were wasting time talking about it, but at least it would be a discussion about something factual. They managed to build an entire two week news cycle on Fox and elsewhere with Republicans like Matt Gates and Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, sitting and reading Dr. Seuss to try and score silly points. And it's all based on nothing. I mean, it's literally factually untrue. Mr. Potato Head's name has not changed. Dr. Seuss has not been banned. And yet they built an entire two week news cycle around it. They're still ongoing. It's, and, it, and to the people who listened and watched, they believe that now. There are millions of Americans who believe Dr. Seuss has been banned. There are millions of Americans who believe that Mr. Potato Head and Mrs. Potato Head are no longer called that when they are. That for me is astonishing. That for me, you know, you, we may laugh at how ridiculous it is, but think about that. Think about how a news channel allied with a political party managed to invert reality in the space of 14 days for tens of millions of people. That is, for my view, is dangerous. And then we take it to the next level or the previous level, you know, put the seuses and the potato heads out of the way. You have an entire media subculture which told tens of millions of Americans in a bubble that the election was stolen, that the election was rigged, that millions of people voted who shouldn't have voted, that ballot boxes were taken in the middle of the night and, you know, machines changed their vote. This was done with ruthless discipline, with coordination by the Republican Party and by Fox News and OANN and Newsmax and Co. Now, you know, when you reach that point, I've been depressed about this for a while, Victor, but, you know, I remember after the 2016 election saying to my executive producer, Al Jazeera, like, what is the point of doing what we do? If Donald Trump can win that election, if 65 or six, whatever million it was in 2016 can vote for Trump, based despite all the lies he told, and what is the point of doing what we do? It's, we might as well go off and be accountants. Not that there's anything wrong with being an accountant, but they might as well do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I live in, I'm an opinion journalist, but I live in a fact-based world. The opinions have to be based on facts. And that 2016 feeling in 2020, that there was a small window where I thought, yay, you know, facts are back, reality's return. And then we had the next three months of January the 6th. And I'm even more depressed now because clearly Republicans, conservatives, their branches of the media have no interest in re-entering a reality-based world. And let me be clear, there are people on the left who also peddle in false information and disinformation. There are people, liberals, who will believe mad conspiracies about their opponents. I'm not denying that. Polarization in general is a problem, but we've gone way beyond just average polarization. We have now reached a point where the right wing of our politics and our media is engaged in a sustained, brazen assault on reality and with reality democracy. Jill and I have talked about this so much, and it's just this media echo chamber that is just giving platform to so much misinformation and disinformation. And does knowing that right wing news organizations operate in almost alternate kind of universe shift your approach to how you cover the news? And then also for you as a journalist now covering, you know, news on MSNBC and Peacock, how do you balance being fair and objective, but then also not giving liars a platform? It's a great, it's a great question, and they're ones we, we we have to navigate. There's no right answer. We're tackling with this in real time. We are trying to deal with this in real time because it's happening uh, in front of us. January sixth happened in front of us. We covered January sixth. How do you cover that? So you know, I, I did a, I did, a, I took part in a panel recently that Peacock hosted with a, a bunch of journalists, and one of the questions was, you know, do you think about having Republicans on your show? How do you work out who to pick? And look, I would love to have more Republicans on my show. You know me, I've just explained to you my whole philosophy. I'm all about jousting debate, argument. The problem is now in 2021, who do you debate with? Which Republicans are left to debate with or interview or hold to account who are living in a reality-based universe? Not many, like you can count them on one hand in the Senate, for example. So the reality is, do I wanna give a platform? Yeah, I could invite someone on and have a shout fest. And you've seen that on some other cable shows. Uh, I'm not a fan of that. 
uh, I, you know, I, I'm all for kind of arguing and having heated conversations, but the other person still has to be in a reality-based universe. There was a time when I thought, and I've interviewed a fair few Trump supporters. If you go to my Twitter feed, my pinned tweet is a very fun interview I did with Steve Rogers, a Fox News regular, former member of the Trump advisory board about Trump in, I think it was 2018, 2019. It went viral, had 8 million views because I just pinned him down again and again. This is a lie. This is a lie. And I made him admit that Trump was lying. But you know those kind of interviews are few and far between now because even when you even when you give those people a platform to try and debunk their lies, you're still giving them a platform. You're still allowing them to spread their misinformation. And for a set, in a sense, you know they treat that as a win. You know Rand Paul went on ABC with Stephanopoulos recently. Stephanopoulos tried to push back a little bit by you know Stephanopoulos' standards. And Rand Paul just goes on Twitter later that day and says, "Here I am owning the liberal media." And it's like that was his aim. He wasn't there to have a good faith interview. It was there as part of his playing to his base. Should we be complicit in that as journalists? So I think a couple of things. Number one, I will interview people on my show, but if they don't agree that the election was not rigged, I don't think those interviews should continue. I think if a Republican comes on air and denies the reality of democracy in this country, the interviewer should just shut it down. That's my personal opinion, each to their own. And then separately, in terms of the right-wing media and how they have become just an organ of disinformation, yeah, it does affect what I cover, Victor. So right now, a lot of the quote unquote mainstream liberal media are obsessed with this idea of a Biden press conference. I mean, should Joe Biden hold a press conference? He is now going to hold one next Thursday. Should he have held one by now? Of course he should have done. Do I want to see him hold a press conference? Yes. But am I going to turn it into some rolling daily nonsensical kind of gotcha? No, because it's clearly come from the right. It's a way of excusing the fact uh, that they've got nothing else to say. And obviously dodging the fact that Donald Trump did hold press conferences and lied his way through them. So what value were they anyway? Let's talk about your interview um, in Esquire magazine. Um, and you've actually covered a lot of the content of that uh, in terms of the style of the UK uh, interview versus the American. And um, so I want to continue on what you were talking about, which is balancing between having an interview where liars lie and continue to spread disinformation, but in a democracy where you have two parties, you would almost have to cut off almost all Republicans, I mean, maybe not Mitt Romney, I'm sure there are a few others, but basically we've had months before the election of 2020 and months after the election of nothing but conspiracy theories and lies. Yeah. So how do you balance the need to let both sides speak um, and yet not spread disinformation? Um, you had a great quote in um, uh, Esquire where you said something about no matter how good the interviewer is, those guys still got a platform and were able to say up is down, black is white, hot is cold. I can say, meaning you, the interviewer, I can say, no, hot is not cold, hot is hot. But as long as they keep repeating it and talking over it, it's a problem and I don't know what we as interviewers do. So yeah. what, what do you think you do? And combine that with Trump's consistent attacks on the media and what that did to the credibility of legitimate news sources. So let me just take the end of your question first. Uh, Trump did a lot of damage uh, to the media. If you look at the polling, you look at Republican faith in the media, obviously there was already a crisis of trust uh, in the media going back to the Wall Street crash, going back to the Iraq war. And you know there were justifiable criticisms of the media. I'm no blind defender of the media. I think there's a lot of lessons that have to be learned from previous crises and the way we covered them. I think there is a genuine trust deficit in terms of uh, how the media covers stories, who's on the media. You know, let's, we haven't had time to get into race and diversity and representation. But I think what happened uh, in the Trump era was this general assault on enemies of the people, fake news, scum, which was echoed by authoritarians across the world, by the way. Um, a lot of foreign leaders and uh, foreign presidents and dictators copied Trump's rhetoric for a reason, to discredit the media. Because, you know, as Steve Bannon once put it, uh, Trump's strategist, he said in an interview with Michael Lewis, our main enemy isn't Democrats. Our main enemy is the media. And the way you deal with the media is flooding the zone with shit, was his phrase. Um, and that is what they have done. Um, and that is what they have uh, achieved. So it is very sad in how Trump basically, there was a line, there's a, there's a quote from Trump where he says, don't believe what you're seeing or reading, believe me. And that is what people have done. That is literally what Republicans, when you look at some of the polling, uh, I can't remember which poll it was a couple of years ago, which ran, found that Republicans trust Trump 
more than they trust news sources, more than they trust their own family members. As a, and that's what he wants. That is what an authoritarian wants. Uh, it's not that he wants you to believe X over Y. He wants you to believe nothing, have a crisis of faith in the media as a whole. Um, and I think one way of dealing with this crisis is first to acknowledge the problem. For too many journalists who had our heads in the sands, we need to recognize what the damage that's been done and why. And that means talking to experts on authoritarianism, on fascism, because this has all been done before in other countries. This has all been done in America in the past. You know, if you talk to people like Ruth ben Giat or Jason Stanley or Tim Snyder, people I've interviewed regularly on my shows, you get a sense of what this all means, how this all adds up, why they are launching this attack on facts, because you cannot get sustained authoritarian rule unless you have a segment of the population that can't distinguish between, you know, to put it metaphorically, hot and cold, black is white. So that's an important part of it. Is there a solution? Sadly, no, I don't know what the solution is. I think the problem is that a media that wants to be fair will say we need to hear both sides. And the problem with hearing both sides is there are no two sides to democracy. There are no two sides to racism. You're not gonna host someone who says, yes, black people should have fewer votes than the rest or black people shouldn't have the same access to voting. You're not gonna host someone who says, you know, Donald Trump won the election, even though it's as plain as day that he did not. So. What do you do? This is the, the $64,000 question. What do you do in a democracy, in a free media that wants to cover politics fairly and objectively, where on the one hand, you want to give both sides a platform. On the other hand, you don't want to platform denialists, spreaders of misinformation, authoritarians, racists. And what happens when one of your two parties is basically taken over by authoritarians, conspiracy theorists and racists? Do you then not give a platform to the entire party? Nobody wants to do that. MSNBC doesn't want to do that. No, CNN doesn't want to do that. Nobody, NPR, nobody wants to have a bunch of Democrats on all the time. I don't. But the problem is, what do you do when it's a two-party system? It's not a multi-party system. It's two parties. That's it. Democrats, Republicans. And the Republicans are showing no interest in reality. So what do you do? I don't know what you do. And I don't know how democracy survives long term if we continue on down this path. I'm sorry to say. Boy, I hate to end our show on that uh, <laughs> note, but um, we have run out of time. And I think we're going to have to have you back to talk about this more because that is one of the crucial questions of yes. how do you talk to Fox News viewers? How do you get the facts out? I remember the times when we had the same facts on all the media. Yeah. We debated what the policies should be that would solve the facts, but yeah. we didn't debate the facts. There was only one, as you said, there yeah. aren't two sides. There is only one set of facts. The alternative facts are lies. And we ought to start, you know, I have a hashtag called say this, not that. And so let's call them lies. That's what they are. It's false information and it's deliberate, so it's disinformation. But you have been most interested. Yeah. I hope you'll thank come Thank you back so much for having me. More about it. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. Appreciate it. Take care.